the past is not the past, that the past somehow still exists, is present in our time. So, so somehow when I'm talking about the past, I'm, I'm speaking about, um, about today and I'm choosing the subjects which I think are relevant. And I want to show that the violence is the part of everyday life of everybody, that no one is really immune against the violence. Well, you know, I, I think that what happened in um, 20th century, especially in the first part of 20th century, 30s, 40s and 50s, um, somehow can happen again. The people who have a pop populist agenda and to give to the people, uh, you see, your situation is bad because somebody is responsible for that and find the kind of the scapegoat. This responsible can be rich, or this responsible can be Jews, or this responsible can be homosexuals. It's always somebody who is different and who is some kind of the minority. Uh, and the people start to believe, yes, if we got rid of them, our life will become the paradise. You know, Agnieszka, we all, at different stages in our life, are consistently you know, fighting for relevance, uh, you know, figuring out purpose, uh, trying to find inspiration. How does consistently creating for five decades uh, work? When I was talking to the students decades ago, like maybe 20 years ago, and they've been asking me, uh, what do you need to have to be a good director? And I said, you need three things, energy, uh, curiosity, and patience. The life is what you have and after it's, you know, you make it sometimes the best you can make and sometimes the worst you can make. I, I try to be honest to myself that it's the main thing. Hello everyone. Welcome to Film Copan. In today's video podcast, we have with us internationally acclaimed legendary filmmaker, Agnieszka Holland, who has been working with the medium of cinema for the last six decades. She began her career as an assistant to directors Christoph Zanushi and Andre Vaida. Her first feature film, Provincial Actors, won the Fipreski Award at the 1980 Cannes Film Festival. Her critically acclaimed film, Europa Europa, released in the year 1992, and the movie In Darkness, released in 2012, were nominated for the Best Foreign Film at the Academy Awards. Europa Europa won the best foreign film at the Golden Globes. In 2017, Agnieszka received the Silver Bear for a film school at the Berlin International Film Festival. Along with her rich filmography, she has also collaborated for many awarded and critically acclaimed television series like The Wire, Prime, House of Cards, The Killing, and many others. She is currently the president of the European Film Academy. It is a momentous occasion for our rather small YouTube channel that Agnieszka, Agnieszka is here with us to discuss our movies. Thank you, Agnieszka, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I would love to travel, you know, to India, but that is not a good time. So uh, <laughs> next time, I hope we'll see each other in person. I'd like to start with the first question. In the last few years of your filmmaking, you have consistently brought us stories of forgotten heroes who sacrificed their everything for the sake of freedom and justice, uh, be it Gareth Jones or Leopold Socha or Jan Palak. What brings you back to these characters every time? You know, I think the past is not the past, that the past somehow still exists, is present in our time. And if we want to understand what's going on with us, it's quite safe to look back uh, because with a certain distance we have, we can see the whole image of the events. And um, when we are doing contemporary movie, we are a bit lost um, in the quantity of uh, changing uh, events and changing times. And um, we don't see the conclusion. We don't, we, we, we can, we can predict something, but we don't see the entire image. So, so somehow when I'm talking about the past, I'm, I'm speaking about, um, about today and I'm choosing the subjects which I think are relevant. 
which are um, putting the light on some forgotten and forbidden crimes, the light on some um, darkest moments in the history of the humanity. And um, I want to show that the violence is the part of everyday life of everybody, that no one is really immune against the violence. No one is immune against the evil. And um, we have to be very conscient that this um, battle between uh, good and bad is happening in our souls. And um, so that are somehow universal subjects, but in the same time, every, every, every uh, time is putting slightly different light on that. We can start, you know, in, in, in um, antique uh, Greece. Uh, we can go through the um, uh, Rome. We can go through the um, Jerusalem with um, um, Jesus Christ. We can, we can, you know, know his history of Buddha. We can, we can know many, many histories. And every of those histories has the similarities and the differences. So, um, and everyone is somehow connected with our time and with our life. So um, when I'm choosing particular subjects, a particular area is because they speak to me personally, like the Second World War in, in Central Europe, the Holocaust, uh, the communist crimes of Stalin. Uh, they are connected to my um, experience or to the experience of my family. Mm. Uh, so they are, um, so they are more, um, uh, interesting for me, and I feel that I understand them better uh, than the events from the different part of the world. But somehow I would like to, to tell them in the way that, that you will understand them as well, even if it's not your personal experience, even if it's not the, your cultural experience, even if your history had the, another dramas or another crimes or another child. Uh, that you can you can to you know, find the relevancy with the uh, with the uh, with my experience. Right, right. right. Uh, Shubhadeep, just before we move on, uh, are you uh, is is the visual coming okay for you for Agnieszka? No, Agnieszka's uh, visual is a little bit blurry, and the uh, I think sound is also breaking a little bit. Yeah, uh, I th I think it is. Uh, uh, well, you know, guys, I am in the countryside. I am okay. in the in the front in my French country home, and okay. the internet is very weak here. Yeah. Okay, it's okay. like you know, it's worse than in small African village where I was yeah. last year. So uh, no worries, no worries. No, it's fine. It's fine. All of you can continue. Yeah, Agnieszka, you just mentioned about the uh, crimes of the communist uh, regime under Stalin. And what we have also seen uh, in your last few films, like in Mr. Jones, uh, we have seen in Burning Bush, also in Charlatan, that you have spoken about what the communist regime did to the human race uh, to a good point. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, of course, seen you make Stalin and Hitler dance together in Europa, Europa. So do you think that, you know, uh, the, right. the crimes of Stalinism that uh, that the world has faced has not been that well called out in our society or in cinema uh, like Nazism has been. And if, if so, why do you think that has happened? And do you think this is a moral obligation from your personal experience to call that out? Those chapters which are not that much, you know, explored or criticized in history? Well, you know, I, I think that what happened in the um, 20th century, especially in the first part of 20th century, 30s, 40s, and 50s, um, somehow can happen again very easily. I think that the humanity somehow uh, shown that the solution of the first populism after um, totalitarianism and autocracy are very easy solution to deal with the uh, injustice and the frustration of the, of the, the, of the, of the people. Uh, and um, if we see uh, unequal uh, situation between different countries or different classes or different castes, uh, we can understand that those who feel 
um, um, persecuted or um, unjustly in, uh, put on the on the side of of of, of their dignity. Uh, they are looking for the solution to take um, how to take the revenge and how to create the society which will be just. Uh, and um, in the moment when this injustice becomes um, very strong, like after the First World War, for example, or after uh, the widest, um, uh, widest um, uh, capitalism of 19th century, uh, it's very easy to come for the ideological um, um, agenda and for the uh, people who have a pop populist agenda and to give to the people, uh, you see, your situation is bad because somebody is responsible for that. And find the kind of the scapegoat. This responsible can be rich, or this responsible can be Jews, or this responsible can be homosexuals. Mm. Um, it, it's always somebody who is different and who is some kind of the minority. Uh, and the people start to believe, yes, if we we'll got rid of them, our life will become the paradise we will be strong again or strong and we will be and the justice will uh, will give us what what um, what uh, what it has to give to us and i think that the situation in the world today start to be as similar after the second world war uh, with the experience of the holocaust when suddenly millions of jews have been um, assassinated in the savage way by the normal culture german people uh, it was such a shock to the humanity that they say never again. Yeah. But and it, it created uh, some kind of the vaccination against this kind of the evil. But this vaccination has its limits, and I think yeah. that it evaporated. I think that we don't we don't we don't feel this um, vaccine anymore. And again, we can see see the race of the similar kind of the ideological agendas. And looking for the, you know, for 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 the responsible of our uh, unlucky uh, situation. It can be refugees today. It can be women who wants to have the power and take it from men. It can be in some countries homosexuals again. Uh, for some countries Jews. For some kind. Uh, for some country um, um, Islamic people. Uh, it's it's possible to find always somebody who we can the, put the, 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 the blame um, on. Uh, and uh, if uh, you find the talented, cynical or crazy leader who will build up some kind of the uh, consistent um, ideological agenda, the millions are following. And uh, this danger, we've seen um, how it works in 20th century in, um, with Nazi and with communists as well, not only in, um, in Soviet Russia, but also uh, in China, for example, or in Korea, you still, in North Korea, you still have this kind of the regime. Yes, yes. Uh, and of course, you know, it's the difference between the Nazi and the communists, because the Nazi was telling openly in Mein Kampf, Hitler wrote everything he did after. It means he was speaking openly about um, assassinating the big part of the, you know, of the citizens, just because they, they've been different race or different religion. Uh, the communists had much more noble agenda. They've been speaking about um, the happiness for everybody, about the better, better uh, radius future, uh, not only for one country or for one nation, but for entire humanity. But the result was pretty much the same. It means millions of people died and um, been killed in the savage way and practically no one paid for that and so you know i don't tell that that is exactly same but this kind of the temptation uh, to exclude uh, to create some kind of the higher race or higher class and exclude the others and reduce them to the state of slaves or to kill them it is not, you know, it is not so far away from us. We, it can, it can happen again. Oh. It's why I, you know, it, those subjects are coming back to me, not only to tell the history, which was, you know, which, which is over, but to say that this history is still present. It can, it, it's like sleeping, mm. but uh, it's very, very close to wake up. 
so do you think uh, agnashka this is happening as you as you talked about the contemporary recent world and the recent events which are happening all around the world do you think it is due to the reason that the memory of the two world wars has slowly been erased from the people we do not remember specifically this new generation we do not know what the horrors where people faced around the world and specifically south A- uh, asia or south asia we were not directly involved in those wars also so what do you feel that uh, probably it's just a loss of collective memory which is causing us to again do things uh, which could lead to disaster well you know i'm not sure if the movies or stories or literature or um, historical essays can change uh, uh, the the history of the world you know maybe we know we see the danger we know the the things which are leading um, uh, events which are leading to the to the to the catastrophe but we are still you have the cassandras you have you know somebody who tells no stop don't go any further but the people are going so i am you know pretty pessimistic about the efficiency of what i'm doing but that is only thing i can do i can tell the stories which i find relevant and instructive and emotionally and emotionally powerful enough that we can um let work our imagination and our empathy i think that it's possible that it's happening right now yeah i think it 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 is latent it is not yet in the state like it was in 30s but if you are um, seeing how many the topic stories um, are fashionable in our times how the books like uh, george orwell 1984 become the best sellers again and how um, philip roth uh, book um, the plot against america became the best seller after uh, donald trump was elected as a president when we see how popular is the, the adaptation of margaret atwood book um, uh, handmaid's uh, tale you know it it is not the and at the same time we know that we have totally new challenges and the new dangers and the, the ecological crisis and the ecological catastrophe which is which is happening right now with the very little action from the governments it is something which didn't happen before it's new for your generation it's your generation who will be facing totally new catastrophe and if you will be not strong enough to stop it or to at least uh, slow it down Uh, you can you can pay it with your life yeah so i think that we are really living very challenging time you know and very dangerous time and of course it's always you know you can tell the laugh stories or the comedies it's a good time for entertainment also we just um, are going through the worst pandemic still uh, spanish flu in 1918 uh, so you know we 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 are we are living like on the volcano somehow uh, but we still want to have the life and enjoy it but in the same time we have the responsibility to react if we see the danger coming agnishka your films might talk about so many harrowing experiences and those stories but there is a certain sense of hope they give because when i watched burning bush it it's such a nerve wracking film but at the end when i realized that that one man who sacrificed himself at the first frame of the film and after 20 years and those three episodes the regime collapses so that's the hope that your films give for us and you know i do not know what cinema might achieve but that hope that that film that story you know with everything that we see on screen at the end the hope that i carry Uh, out of the theater is a big big and i i cannot thank you enough we all cannot thank you enough for taking uh, you know so much effort to bring these stories to us thank you i'm i'm glad that you understand this in the way because i don't think that making the sacrifices or fighting for freedom or fighting for the justice it's vain even if you if you if you are paying with your life something you know some kind of the germ is coming some kind of the you know of the uh, of the new life is coming out of that the new hope and um, it it doesn't happen immediately often you have to wait quite a long time before uh, it becomes like the new reality but um, uh, known to to everybody or to either group of people but um, i i don't think that 
the heroic acts are always rewarded. But I think they are somehow rewarded in your soul, and at least for some people. Yeah. And um, we have just to do what we think we can do and um, without thinking if it will be successful or not. Because if you are, if you are, if you are like um, uh, calculating your success, you, ha you can have no success and no, um, and no, the, you know, no dissatisfaction. Yeah, absolutely. And in that context, I wanted to talk about Europa Europa again, such a such a different kind of World War uh, Two movie that you got for us, which does not talk much about the Holocaust and you know the impact. It does not talk about the war or you know the good versus evil kind of structure. On the other hand, you expose the shallowness of this identity, you know, the identity conflict or the racial uh, supremacy that is the kind of crux of the wars, and. Um, you know, it's a it's a so different kind of a film. What I wanted to know is, was that all from the memoir of uh, Solomon Perel, or was it your own personal experiences also that you bring into this film? Because we actually see so many good Germans, right? There are, I mean, we see the Germans as good as any other, and we also see them as influenced by the false ego and. A pride like any other, like the Jews or the R Russians or the Poles. So was it was it also your personal experience talking in that film? Yes, for sure. It means it's pretty faithful to uh, Solomon's um, uh, memoirs. Uh, and uh, the most incredible facts really happened in his life. But in the same time, it's told from my point of view and from my personal experience. And he's asking the questions which are interesting to me. Uh, his story um, uh, provoked me to ask the questions about the identity, as you say, about if the people are condemned to be bad or good, or how much the circumstances are playing in your destiny and in your choices, uh, and what, uh, what is your inner true heart? What is your real identity? Um, and you know what I liked um, uh, with the in story of Solomon in Europa Europa, uh, it is that somehow you know his identity is a little piece of skin on his pe penis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If he wasn't circumcised, he maybe will become the Nazi very easily, and he will because he wanted to be very much like others. He wanted to believe in what his uh, fellows believed. Uh, he wanted to feel the part of the community. But he couldn't completely do it because he, you know, if he want, went to pee, um, the, this little piece of the skin remind him who he really is yeah. and where are his roots. So I find it, you know, humorous and tragic in the same time. And what I like in, in this story, that's a lot of humor, even if it's speaking about the most tragic events in the history of the humanity. Mm -hmm. That's true. And so beautifully, the last scene shows this man, after the everything he goes through, he can openly pee with no, no one to think about. So, <laughs> I mean, I mean, a World War II movie ending in that tone. I mean, I really don't know how to how to express myself about it. <laughs> uh, Thank you. No uh, moving on, uh, Agnieszka, I wanted to talk about Spoor, your uh, Silver Beer winning film. So we see one of the characters in Spoor uh, say that uh, you cannot every time leave it to the authorities. At times you have to take it in your own hand. And we also see the narrative follow that kind of uh, philosophy. Uh, in Europa, Europa, you know, where, even if it was a World War II movie, it was not violence meeting with violence. But do you think the world has come to a point that that becomes the only inevitable option that you show in school? Well, I don't, you know, I, as I say, I, I'm asking the questions. I don't have the answers. Okay, the yeah. answers is some, somehow um, up to you, you know, to, to say. And I'm not making like the moral tales. I'm not mm -hmm. telling, you know, he, that is right and that is wrong. I'm I'm just telling the possibility, and the, you know which which uh, uh, which you have in front of you, the choices you have or the lack of choice you have, yeah. uh, and what you can do with that. 
of course, you know, the story of um, uh, Miss Dusheiko, it's a very paradoxical story because I love this character, but in the same time, of course, I cannot accept her acts. Mm. On another hand, I understand the anger. And it was, a, it was a story, you know, about the anger as well, justified anger of injustice, of, of you know, of the, of the elimination of, 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 you know, of something which is the most, um, most important to you. Um, but the anger is, with the anger, is a bit like with the fire, you know, the fire can be great or can be very dangerous. The fire can lead you and warm you or it can destroy everything with the, you know, with the, to burn everything. So with the anger, it's pretty much the same. It can make you strong and just, but it can, it can also lead you to, to, to the violence. Thank and you. that is this, this, this paradox is important. And also, you know, I, I wanted to, to make this film. It's based on the book by my friend Olga Tokarczuk, who after received the Nobel Prize for the Literature. Uh, and the book is very paradoxical also, you know, the, the film is close to the book, but not completely. It has its own, you know, storylines and a little different conclusion. Uh, but for Olga, um, the life of the animals and the justice um, um, of the animals and, you know, and the, and the, uh, and the sufferance of the animals is something which is really vitally important. And uh, I think that you have more and more people for whom the mm, approach of the hunters, it's impossible to, hunters symbolically speaking, hunters some men of power, you know, who think that they have the right to decide who has the right to live and who have the right to not live. That this, um, that this, um, that this uh, psychology of the hunters becomes more and more difficult to accept. Uh, right. I um, right. remember I shown this film uh, in Hong Kong Film Festival, and it was um, the Indian director there from your country uh, who've been watching it. I don't remember his name, but he did a very interesting movie as well, uh, and um, was, which was shown on the festival. And he told me, you know, this film, Spur, it could be made in India. It is very much like, you know, our story. So. I was thinking that it's a little political film about Poland, but uh, about patriarchal society. But I think by the end of this uh, of the day, it can be pretty universal. It is. It is, of course. Um, in spite of so many heartening films, Agnieszka, few of which we have spoken about, we have heard you mention that the Secret Garden is your most personal film. Of course, we love Secret Garden, and it also is very very impactful. But we wanted to hear from you about this special connection with the film. Um, the Secret Garden, you know, uh, the book, because it, uh, the film is based on the classic book, but um, um, uh, by a uh, uh, British, um, uh, British writer. And um, uh, uh, I read it as a child and it was one of my favorite books. So um, when I decided to make my first American movie, I had after Europe, Europe, I had a lot of offers from the American studios. And um, I knew that if I will take something um, with a big budget and big stars, it would be very difficult to, to, um, uh, to keep my freedom. Because, you know, more money you have, less freedom you have as a, as a filmmaker. Uh, so when I read the script um, of Secret Garden um, and it was produced by Francis Ford Coppola, yeah. I thought it, it's an ideal movie for me as a first American film because it's British classic. I understand, you know, perfectly well the psychology and the culture of this, of this book. Uh, it woke up my imagination as a child. It's full of, um, of um, emotional symbolism. Uh, and it speaks as well to the children, like to the grown-ups, if you will do it right. Uh, so I tried to do it right. And it was pretty difficult for film to make, technically speaking, and working with animals and, and children, and working with Warner Bros., you know, uh, with their restrictions and their, you know, their um, corporational moods. Uh, but I, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty proud of this film and... Um, like it was made in 94, I think. So practically 
30 years later, it still has life. And um, I was talking to a British producer who is working with Colin Field recently. And um, it was a new version of Secret Garden, new adaptation, yep. yes. uh, where Colin yes. Field played. And uh, Colin Field is my dog. Yeah, yeah. Colin Field, <laughs> said, Colin Field said, oh, you know, I prefer much more her Secret Garden than the Secret Garden I was in. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> So I see that it's still, you know, that the people still and children still are watching it and 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 and, and have the real emotion and it's great, you know. It's it's nothing. It's as satisfy um, satisfy doesn't give you such a satisfaction as a filmmaker when you are watching um, the cinema theater full of children between four and uh, and uh, fourteen. And they are like amazed, you know. It's the best audience you can have. So, I, I really, I'm, 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 I'm sorry that I didn't do another one of the kind. Maybe I will do before stopping making movies. <laughs> please do, please do. We will love to have that. Marek, spokój, pies nie szczeka. Dobrze, dobrze. Well, he doesn't listen to me. <laughs> There, there's a kind of uh, you know poetic. Uh, there's a kind of poetic imagine, uh, imagery you bring on the screen. You know, I wanted to talk about that because um, I got reminded of that scene when the father comes back and finds um, uh, Colin playing in the garden. That scene, Anishka, I mean that scene. Uh, that scene is so beautiful, and you keep on bringing that kind of scene. If I remember. Uh, in Europa, Europa, the whole sequence where uh, there is this tram ride across the ghetto, or in uh, To Kill a Priest, uh, the first scene itself, where you know there's a demonstration going on, and one of the kids makes a hole in the opaque window and watches outside. So these scenes, you know, this this you know beautiful poetry on screen, does that all come from the script, or when you are shooting them, when you are actually doing the filming? It evolves like the way it is. I mean, how how does that visual strategy work for you? Um, you know, the um, to kill a priest and um, Europa Europa, I wrote myself, so I was imagining it practically when writing the script. But um, very often it comes uh, during this uh, shooting time that it comes out from the you know from like from the reality of the shooting, from the from the set, from the actor, from the light, from my, my collaborators and so. And if I, if I remember, um, if I uh, remember correctly, I think that the uh, scene when Colin is uh, blindfolded yes. and finds his father, but it wasn't written in the script. I think it was okay. not. Okay. I think, uh, I think we, we came with that when, you know, when, when, when thinking how to shoot this scene. Because I, I, I like, you know, I don't like to have too much of information in the script, how, how the scenes will look like. I want the like general, um, general um, construction to have in the script by to, to, to put the meat on the skeleton only when I'm shooting. And the shooting time is for me the most inspiring and the most like joyful also. It stands because you never have enough of time and you know the light is not what you wanted and you know the things like that and the, and the actor forgot you know the text uh, during the most beautiful take and so on. You, you have a lot of little things which makes you angry but in the same time you have so much of the inspiration and it's so joyful when it all come together uh, that is why I'm making movies after so many years, you know, that this joy every time is new and it's every time intense. And, you know, any movie is like the previous movie. Even the joy of, of filmmaking is uh, happening for me in the first play during the shooting time. Because you have some directors who like the preparation and writing and some who like the most um, editing. For example, Krzysztof Kieślowski was the happiest during the editing. And I like the shooting. It's my, you know, it's my battlefield, and in the same time, the field of joy. Hi, good evening. Hi. Uh, Hello. It <laughs> is it is absolutely wonderful and surreal to be on a phone call with you. It is Thank so wonderful. You. 
uh and, and i i really want to i don't want to interrupt this please finish what you were saying and i can just carry on from there okay thank you so much nice to see you so this is uh, spriti uh, she was supposed to join we couldn't we couldn't tell you spriti is the artistic director of the mami mumbai international film festival so she graciously agreed also to uh, uh, join us uh, how <laughs> Shubhadeep, how could I not? First of all, I want to thank you and Arup for creating this opportunity. Uh, we've been actually wanting to get um, Agnieszka. We've been wanting to get you to the festival, and we were in conversation actually, but you were very busy at that point of time. I'm hoping that whenever the world is ready to congregate again, we can actually get uh-huh. you to Mumbai and. like these two wonderful gentlemen who are absolute cinema lovers have created this opportunity uh, you will be surprised to uh, meet the legions of fans that you have in india you know if if it will be only possible again and the world become normal and um, my situation will allow it i will come with great pleasure okay another another very interesting thing that i have noticed in most of your films is the children they are always there and the roles that they play you know might not be going by the length of the roles but the impact that roles create for the whole film uh, they are exemplary performances you get out of child actors i i wanted to know what do you brief them because in most of the films they are in so harrowing si- situations you know say in uh, mr jones the whole ukrainian sequence or in darkness uh, you have the children who are supposedly underground in a sweat system do they actually understand what they are playing or i mean i want to understand how do you brief them how do you make them understand what's the context of the film what they are doing and what they are expected to do i you know i think that the the children understand much more than we think they do and uh, the mm, when uh, when i'm working with the children on the difficult subject uh, i try to um, tell them the truth but of course in the way which will be not violent or which will be not like um, um uh, traumatic and uh, you have to you have to you know you have to convey with the parents because it has to be like the same kind of the you know of the narration we cannot tell to the child different stories the parents and myself and sometimes you need some kind of the psychological help uh, but in generally i try to not to lie to children and uh, don't to tell them for example when they are facing in the movie in they are facing the dead mm. that it's that they are not facing the dead i just say that it's a, some kind of the that it's not true that we, we are telling this story it's some kind of the game but we have to understand that the people that the thing terrible things happens yeah and we are doing the, the telling the story you know to to help that it will not gonna so i remember you know when i uh, when i was a secret guard and which is a children's but the same plot of a very dark moment in the story you know the parents of the you know first he was not laughed after the parents of her died after she she went alone to this like terrible mansion where with the hunchback uncle who didn't want to see her and and so on and so on so it was a lot for the child uh, and um, i understood that this girl who is playing mary has understood it uh, and i was showing her several movies not children movies but the movies with the children i i remember that i shown her the um, andrei tarkovsky film um, Uh, Ivan's childhood. Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you know this film? Yes, yes, yes. yes. It's and I think that it helped her to understand what what is the dark side of the of the life, which normally the parents are not talking to the children about it because they they don't want to traumatize them exactly. But the children knew. I remember I was um, uh, when I was in uh, Leo, I had the puppy. Uh, the little dog i loved a lot and this dog became sick when he i don't know 3 months something or 4 months 
and he died eventually. My parents rushed to me, and they say that uh, he's in doubt that he would be after, and the, you know, he knew that the puppy died. I knew it. And they wanted, you know, to, to, to help me, you know, to, to make the life nicer. And, but I knew that the puppy died, and I, I, I was very alone with this knowledge because I didn't, I didn't share it with my parents because they, I understood that they are too afraid to tell me the truth. And I didn't want to tell them that I know the truth because, uh, you know. So I think that children really know a lot and understand a lot. But in the same time, they are fragile, fragile human beings, and you cannot treat them like the grown-ups. So you need to you you need to be pedagogical about it, and you need to be somehow the parent to those children. But in the same time, it never work. You you have to understand that they they are human beings. It means, and that they understand a lot. And sometimes you know, sometimes if they don't want to play. Uh, they are not playing, you know, but most of children who, who wants to be in the movie, and I was working only with the children who wanted to, to be an, the actors, the little actors, not with the children who've been just pushed by the parents to become a little star. It's a lot of children like that in Hollywood. Um, and they are, you know, it's playful for them. They have the satisfaction. When they, when they do something right, they are happy, you know, so they become little professionals and... Um, Except of once, I never had the problem with the ch with the child actor. Mm -hmm. Only thing which is problematic is that you have all these rules that you can that they can play on. I don't know, depending on the country, three hours or five hours a day that they need. In America, they have to have every one hour the you know the interruption for the schooling and the things like that. It disorganizes the shooting time, which is always very very stressful. So. Yeah. It's only reason why I say after the movie never again with children. But you know, after every movie, I said I, I I don't like to work with children with animals to shoot in the train, to shoot in the car, to shoot during the night, to shoot shoot in the cold. And after I'm finishing with the movie, when I have child, uh, the dog, uh, <laughs> night, uh, and you know, and then frozen, frozen, frozen cold. So yeah. That's because your films come from real life. <laughs> That's not coming only from, you know, a made up script. Yeah, it's, it's why I'm not, you know, shooting mostly on the beautiful beach, but in some... <laughs> <laughs> um, Smriti, please go ahead with your questions. You know, I actually wanted to ask you that you've been creating now almost for uh, five decades. Uh, and, and um, you know, Agnieszka, we all at different stages in our life are consistently, you know, fighting for relevance, uh, you know, figuring out purpose, uh, trying to find inspiration. Um, what, how, does, how does consistently creating for five decades uh, work? And what is it that gets you excited about waking up in the morning? Well... I, you know, I don't know. It's uh, it, it is very difficult to analyze yourself. I don't feel, I still don't feel like that is five decades. I am, you know, every movie is like the new adventure. Maybe it's why, maybe it's why it's so exciting, you know, to make movies that it's never the same. It 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 keeps you, you know, awake. You cannot sleep during, and but you need the energy. It's true. And, um, and when I was talking um, to the students uh, decades ago, like maybe twenty years ago, and they've been asking me, uh, "What do you need to have to be a good director?" And I said, "You need three things: energy, uh, curiosity, and patience." And it's true that with the age, you are losing those capacities. You are less curious. You have less energy, of course, and you are not so patient anymore because you, you don't have time to be patient. Uh, so when I feel that it's over, that all those three sources of strength are evaporating, I will stop. But uh, don't I don't feel it yet. <laughs> What, what stopped me a bit is, is this pandemic because I've, during this pandemic, I've, I stayed for one 
year practically in, in my country house, uh, except uh, some little travels to promote charlatan. And I was happy, you know, suddenly I was, you know, I was not working and I was happy. I was thinking about possible movie. Uh, I was reading some scripts sent to me and most of the scripts had this stamp COVID friendly. <laughs> COVID-friendly script, it means when you can shoot in one room with two actors, you know, or outside, you know, in the garden with two actors. Uh, but, uh, but I didn't find anything which, like, made me so excited about making another film. So I don't have uh, <clears throat> the project, sure project for the next year. I, I, I try to write something, but I don't know what will happen. So, you know, I think it's great to work, to do, the, to do the job and to be creative in the field you like and to, to feel full somehow when doing it. But in the same time, not doing it is not the, you know, it's not the drama. You can, you can express yourself in different way. And what interests me still is exactly what's going on with the world around of me. So I am very, you know, political somehow. I am, you know, watching the news from around the world. I know pretty well the politics in three countries. I'm living in Poland, in, in France, and in the United States, and, and also in Czech Republic, which is very close to me because it's my, you know, field of inspiration. So, you know, uh, the life is what you have, and after it's, you know, you make it, Sometimes the best you can make and sometimes the worst you can make. I, I try to be honest to myself. That is the main thing. Yes, another thing I wanted to ask you was that some of the most iconic shows uh, that we've been consuming and the youth has been consuming, um, you know, you've directed episodes uh, of The Killing and The Wire, uh, The Affair, um, House of Cards. What was it like working in that? Um, you know, uh, um, I uh, when I I realized that at some point, and it was by the end of um, of twentieth um, uh, century, that the cinema became a little less accessible and attractive to the people. It means you had two kind of the cinemas, which um, one very commercial, or another very you know very. Um, um, elitist, like the festival kind of the cinema, and the, something which I call the cinema of the middle, the personal cinema with the interesting stories which are accessible and attractive to the people, but in the same time are complex. This kind of the cinema practically disappeared. And um, in, this, uh, in this empty space, it was the ambitious TV series which came. Uh, with HBO and um, after with another platforms or cables. And suddenly I found much more interesting and challenging material in those series than in, in the cinema scripts. It's why I tried it. And um, um, especially the experience with, with, with the Wire and Treme was fantastic one because the uh, author of that, David Simon, the, the simulator, he's so rooted in the reality of the American cities and understands so well American tragedy, American contemporary tragedy, that doing those series, I learned more about America than, than most of Americans actually. It was a great experience for me. It was a great lesson of the reality, not filmmaking even, but the reality. So I'm very grateful for that. And sometimes I'm, I was doing the series like House of Cards because it was iconic series. I wanted to meet those actors and I was curious how I will fit into this world. Uh, sometimes I was just, you know, wanted to make something quick because I was after a long, mo long movie and felt that I need some kind of the bust of the energy. Um, but recently I'm doing less and less of that because it's... It, the series became a little predictable to me. I, you know, I'm reading the script or watching the episode and I know, you know, the rules. And I'm also only, you know, attracted to that if I don't know the rules, if I have to rediscover it or discover it for myself. Right. Oh, wonderful. One question that I had, now that you are the 
you know, you are the head of the European Film Academy. What do you think to be your prime most responsibility, you know, as a, as a head of a film academy? Well, you know, especially now with the, with the pandemic and with the people, you know, closing their um, homes and a lot of the distribution companies practically on the border of the bankruptcy and with the uncertainty, if the people, the audience will come back to the movie theaters the same way like before, I think that we have to fight for preserving the cinema and European cinema, which I think is very important because it's only cinema when the filmmaker is more important uh, than the, you know, uh, the, the studio or the, you know, distributor or whoever. Uh, but to do it, we need to, to be together, to collaborate. So the goal of the academy is like to, to, to unite the people from different countries, but with the same goal uh, and to collaborate and to join the forces. But in the first place, to promote courageous, unique cinema, which can attract the audience. It means I, I feel that we can survive as a, as a cinema in, in those days only if we will be making better films more original, more courageous, more personal, more challenging. Uh, so, you know, that is my goal, like to, to, to inspire people to, to, to not to be afraid, to be, to be courageous. Uh, thank you so much for that. Agnieszka, thank you so much for joining us today. And it was such a sheer pleasure to have you on this channel. And uh, uh, we are really, really grateful and privileged to have the opportunity to talk to you uh, in this in this pandemic time thank you thank you so much seriously thank, thank you. you what a what a wonderful uh, way to uh, you know spend an evening just listening to you and talking to you and i really hope that we do this in india in better times uh, and in person so thank you so much agnieszka so wonderful to meet you Thank you, guys. You are wonderful. You are fantastic. And your questions are so insightful and so, you know, intelligent. That is really a pleasure talking to you. And I hope as well that we'll do it in person. So good luck and, you know, keep, keep going. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you so much.